you know, some really interesting things on uh, the 5-ASA and ulcerative, uh, ulcerative colitis. Uh, Budesonide or Entricort in Crohn's disease. Um, I, I'm going to take the opportunity to uh, present some of the slides that our medical student uh, just presented at last week's Digestive Disease Week. Like, great name for a, for a meeting, eh? <laughs> but it's 40,000 GI types. There's 4,000 posters that are presented, 1,000 different oral, oral uh, abstracts that are presented. And hers uh, was an oral abstract and chosen as one of the best 80 of the entire meeting and is going to be coming out in uh, 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 the best of DDW 2013, and it's uh, uh, based on uh, stuff out of here. So I was pretty proud to watch her do that. She was plenty nervous, but anyway. And then uh, what I'm going to really talk about is some fun stuff we're doing with the basic research. So uh, what's known with the severe UC is, uh, you know, about 30% of the kids uh, require hospitalization at least once for um, severe disease. 40% of those will fail corticosteroids and uh, require a colectomy. And, and uh, you know, we, last year I presented how we're down to five days of steroids before we jump to the uh, Remicade now. And that gets it down to about 20%. So we, they've been looking at, uh, you know, uh, how, do you, how can you tell, um, you know, why don't some respond? And it's a, it's a big question. We really don't know. They've been looking at this IL-6, which is a small molecule. And a high level has been linked um, with those that don't respond, so we thought maybe we had a marker. Um, but it didn't, you know, it doesn't turn out that it's any much better than the clinical. And uh, so I, we're still at the point, you know, maybe this IL-6 is interfering with the response or, or, or really that there's just so much inflammation there that the steroids aren't going to, you know, it overwhelms the system. So... What about uh, these, the, you know, um, why did some kids uh, flare when prednisone is stopped? So that's what's known is 40% uh, uh, will flare uh, and they're steroid dependent, so it's very high. Um, so within the cells, there's these pumps there. And so we looked at one of the pumps that pumps out drugs out, out of the system. Uh, and it goes by this uh, fancy name. I don't know where they make up these names, but, you know, and there's variations of these genes, and we wanted to, to look uh, to see if, if that's related to dependency, and it may be. But, uh, you know, that doesn't help us therapeutic-wise. So there's, there's reasons coming out, but it's not helping us in the clinic. Now, this, this is the, um, the, the information on the 5-ASA in, in ulcer colitis and clid, kids. And, you know, the aminosalicylates, there's strong evidence uh, for getting it under control or the induction phase or keeping it under control. That's the maintenance phase. But there's not a whole lot in kids. I mean, we just sort of took these drugs and started using them in kids. And that's just the way it's been up until recently. So we've, we, we then looked at in our registry, which is a large cohort, there's three Canadian centers and 29 in the U.S. now, so they're following a large number of kids in, in now over a decade. So uh, um, it's one of the most productive ones. So there's uh, 17, well, about 1,700 kids uh, uh, diagnosed, uh, just about 500 with UC in this um, in database, and uh, over 350 being followed for a year now. And uh, but, oh, just over 200 corticosteroids, but no other medications uh, other than the 5-ASA. So, you know, the interesting thing is 40%, um, you know, they'd get their initial treatment with, with steroids or whatever, and they'd be fine at a year. But we don't know why. Like, we can't pick them out at the beginning. You know, we don't, it's not related to how severe they are at the beginning or the dose of the 5-ASA or any of the lab values of diagnosis is not gender related. Some people just, you know, can get on these 5-ASAs after they get under control and do fine. But we can't tell at the beginning. We want to know because then you don't over-treat or under-treat, right? Uh, and in terms of side effects, any was 9% any meaning diarrhea, tummy aches or stuff that you can associate with the disease. But of all those kids, there's only two severe ones. One was an allergy, which, you know, is not that surprising, and pancreatitis, which we know about. So relatively safe drugs. 
So what's, what's the most recent going on? And there's this National Institute of Health that protects study. And so um, there's three Canadian centers, 13 American. So CHEO's involved in this thing. And I think this is, this is really a breakthrough concept in doing studies and, and critically important. And it's really for these new kids coming in diagnosed. And what it is, is, is what I would call a standard of care study. So, so the investigators got together and said, you know, what's our best practice? And it's very close to what we're doing. It's a very regimented follow-up. We're getting some bio samples. And finding out, uh, you know, um, is there going to be anything that can predict who's going to do well? That's the hope. I think far more important with this thing is we're not going to have any more studies in kids that are looking at a new drug uh, that's done to placebo. And I think that's critically important. I think any new drug comes out has to be better than the standard of care. So this is very much like the oncology people and very much like the cystic fibrosis and now it's coming to IBD. So I think this is a huge important you know, concept in taking care of kids. No more are we going to be trying to take adult data, fitting it into a kid. So I think this is key. Antocort or bedesonide, uh, you know, it's a corticosteroid rapidly broken down by the liver enzymes. So there's not that, if, if it does get absorbed, that you don't have anywhere near the side effects of prednisone. Um, the coating of the drug allows it to get through the, 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 the stomach and, and target the terminal ileum and ascending colon. And in adults, uh, it's been known to be helpful, not as good as prednisone, uh, but it, it can treat mild to moderate. And, you know, what's happening in kids. We've all kind of learned how to do it, which is less than ideal. But in this IBD registry, again, there was a, close to 120 kids uh, that had been uh, prescribed this drug. So we just looked at how people are using it. And I guess the good news is it's almost always used f for kids with disease in that part of the gut that it's designed to use. So 95%. That's encouraging that we're not using it for wrong wrong areas. <laughs> but it's also used in combination with a lot of other meds. So, you know, it's a, I guess the thought is there, if you don't want to go straight to steroids, try with a combination to see if it'll take the Crohn's under control. I guess about half end up on prednisone, so it's, it's not overly effective. Uh, but it, it, it can transition sometimes off of prednisone easier if you're trying to buy time for the methotrexate or, or imuran or other things. So I think it's in the armamentarium of what we're using. Um, so this is the, um, this is the, um, this is some data from, uh, from uh, what I've been working with one of the medical students at uh, University of Ottawa. She's actually graduated and, and I'm glad to say she's going into pediatrics. She's decided to go to sick kids, so we'll have to try and recruit her back here to do PDGI at some point. And um, so what, she, what we wanted to look at is, you know, what's happening over time with the use of prednisone? I mean, we've all been trying to say, let's try and get off of this, let's try and use other things, you know, but what's, what's really happening over a decade? So uh, this was out of the uh, I, IBD registry data, about 1,500 um, uh, uh, kids. And uh, then the ones that followed for over a year and, and had prednisone uh, was about 1,300 or so. And then we looked at two time periods. So 2002 is when we started the registry. So we looked at the first three years. And then we looked at another time point, uh, 2006 to 2010. 2010 because that gave a year follow-up. And we had about 700 in each group and then broke it down to Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. So these are, these are big numbers. So this is uh, a bit of a complex graph, but I'm going to run you through it. You know, essentially um, for Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis in the first three months of use, about 70% of kids are exposed to prednisone because, it, you know, they're moderate, severe coming in. And by one year or Q4, there's not that many more that get it. You know, it's mostly in the first when they're diagnosed, which makes sense. I mean, that's when they're the sickest. But what's happened is they're not exposed to it every single quarter. So we've seen a dramatic decrease over the last 10 years in how much prednisone overall the kids are getting. So they might get it up front, but then they're not given it long term. 
there used to be protocols where prednisone was given every other day low dose for months on end. And we're just seeing those disappear now. They don't work. There's, there's other drugs out there. Um, and this is seen in both uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. I think the ulcerative colitis, uh, when we looked at other factors, that could be related to the biologics, but it's not with Crohn's disease because they've been out a decade now. So this is a real change in practice. You know, we're just not using it long term. I think that's good. So it's commonly used, uh, particularly in the first three months, to get it under control. But this prolonged exposure is uh, really decreasing down. So I think this is good news. We have more, more things we're using. Okay, now we're going to talk about the hardcore research. So this will be fun. So uh, some of you know we're, we're collecting these uh, washings. So the one on the uh, left-hand side is the bowel cleaned out. And it looks like there's nothing in there, right? So we do is a, a jet of water on the bowel. And actually there's this mucus layer that's tightly adherent onto the lining of the gut. So on the right-hand side, you can see where that, that water isn't clear. It's a little cloudy. It's got little shards of mucus in it. And then those little shards of mucus is the epithelial cells and the bacteria. So what we're then doing with the, these mucosal washings is we're, we're collecting the DNA and running them through some very fancy uh, analysis. And we're also getting the protein and running through them, very fancy analysis. We can separate bacteria proteins and human proteins and all this kind of stuff. So what we're trying to do is really look at what's happening at the interface between the inside of the gut and the lining of the gut. So in other words, right where the site of inflammation is happening. So this is a very fancy diagram. It's beautiful colors, but it's telling us a lot. Each ring, the center ring, and then each concentric ring is telling us what type of bacteria are there. So this is kind of like the inner ring would be your automobile. And then the next ring would be, say, a Ford. And then the next ring would be your Ford Fiesta. The next ring, your Ford Fiesta with air conditioning package on it. And then the final would be Ford Fiesta with the air conditioning package and blue. So this outer ring is telling us specific types of bacteria that are there. And then we, we can compare it normals to Crohn's disease, and I'm just showing you that. I'm not showing you the ulcerative colitis. So everything, all the different bacteria that are different from normal are shown in red here. There's a huge number. So that's interesting. And you might say, well, why did you look at bacteria in the first place? Well, this is one of those studies that started right with the parents. And I don't know how many parents over the years have said, I can tell when my kid has got a flare of Crohn's versus an infection because the stools smell different. And for a long time, I thought, well, OK, maybe the bacteria are breaking down you know, the proteins in the blood. And you get these amides, and they're not great smelling. But it didn't fit. So it's always been in the back of my head. So we, we kind of looked at, you know, there's a huge number of bacteria to, to look there. So we thought, okay, what are bad smelling bacteria? And sulfur is. So we scanned through here with some pretty powerful technology. And we had this one little spike up here that was one of the, that just stood out. And it's the, eight, the hydrogen sulfide producing organism that's never before been described in human gut. We said, well, that's interesting. So then, then uh, with that, we then, um, we, we've done a couple things. And a lot of the details are on the posters out there. So I'll give you the, the Coles Notes version, you know. We then looked at how uh, the human cells are reacting to this. And these bacteria are shutting down the detoxification. So they're not getting rid of, they're more sulfur producing and the body's not reducing it down. So you're creating a very different microenvironment. And this hydrogen sulfide is very inf inflammatory producing, it's thought. So we thought, OK, that's all interesting, but let's prove it. So what we did uh, was we then gave mice this bacteria. And uh, lo and behold, what did we see? So if I'm not scoping your kids, I'm scoping 30 gram mice now. <laughs> and these are pictures from the mice. 
So these controls, you know, you can see it's nice pale pink and nice sharp blood vessels on there. And you look at the right hand side and that's red and it's sore and it's just from this bacteria going in there. Like that's shocking, right? So this is a local microenvironment. Uh, No, they were never in there. These are human bacteria going into a mouse and causing this. Never been, I think it's, it's you know, where are these, like the hydrogen sulfur, you sort of see these with bad breath. So I think a local microenvironment is starting to be created. Now the real question is, what's creating it? You know, are you getting mucosal breaks? And, and, and then the blood has more oxygen in there that would normally not be there? Are these viral infections now altering the mucosa so the immune system that may be predisposed can't handle these bacteria? Those are huge questions going on, huge questions. You're exactly where we're at, what's going on here? But to show that this is not straightforward, you know, you kind of think, okay, who's going to help us do this data? So we're getting terabytes of data out of this thing. So the first thing we got was a really, really big computer to handle this stuff. And the next thing we said, well, you know, we can get some biology people, but maybe we need some people smarter than, you know, people who think in biology. So we got some applied mathematicians. And these guys love terabytes of information. So they created a model, you know, to look at normal and abnormal, and, and they've come up with these communities of bacteria. So it's not a single thing. It's these communities coming together that are either promoting or they're all acting synergistically to affect the whole thing. And these are some of the, you know, these are all going up or all going down together and we're just teasing this stuff out right now. And I mean, this is incredibly massive right now. So we've got, we've got this environment that's, that's developing an, an, a, a pro-inflammatory. It's shutting down some of the anti-inflammatory mechanisms of the host. Here's our chronicity. Clearly, antibiotics aren't going to work. I mean, that's going to give, like all studies, short-term solutions, but you're going to get resistant organisms. It's not going to do it. That's not the way to go. We've got to change this local microenvironment, and I'm not sure exactly how. So this is, this is, um, this is a, a, a fairly significant study that's underway now.